good morning. We mark the beginning of this time together with these words from the door of the Unitarian Church in Dublin, Ireland. Even as our own congregation continues to be exiled from the place that holds us in body and spirit, we know that within each of us is a spark of this community. Thus, we one and all bear a piece of that house and bring them with us as we revisit the life of one of our 19th century Unitarian Universalist cousins. We bid you welcome to this house. It is a place we love and which we tend with care. We do not ask that you believe or expect you to think the way we do, but only that you try to live a kindly, helpful life with dignity proper to a human being. Preachers here have the task of presenting religion fearlessly, freely, and faithfully. Hearers have the responsibility of testing what they hear, not only with the critical mind, but also with the living of everyday life. The members of this congregation welcome the support of all those who believe that religion is wider than any sect and deeper than any set of opinions, and all might find in their friendships strength and encouragement for daily living. Well. Hello everybody, thanks for joining us again. If we haven't met, my name is Don Rollins and I serve as accredited interim minister to our congregation here in Hendersonville, North Carolina. We appreciate you being with us. Last week I talked about Ralph Waldo Emerson went through roughly about half of his life, and today I'm picking up on the rest. If you did not see that first version, you might want to do that. It does help fill in some of what I'll be talking about today. It's going to get a little heady in places, uh, but then again, we're talking about some pretty big-scale ideas when we talk about Emerson and the other transcendentalists. So, follow along. Robert Richardson's excellent biography on Ralph Waldo Emerson Mind on Fire, includes a photograph of a 74-year-old man with his son and his grandson. He's grayed, wrinkled, balding, as he holds young Charles L. Emerson, and he's smiling. He is broadly smiling. If you were with us for that December 3rd service, you know the Oracle of Concord, as Emerson came to be known. He earned that smile for his life had been full of loss and what he called more than once his winter, his recurring bouts of depression. But even in what we'd hoped would be a time of rest for Emerson, the clouds found him. Charles, the young child in the photo, would die before Emerson. He was 31 years old in 1834. By then he had survived with the help of Aunt Mary Moody Emerson an impoverished childhood, poor health, the rigors of college and seminary, disillusionment, disillusionment with Unitarian Christianity, and of course he had lost his young wife, Helen. Yet that year would be a watershed experience for Emerson. He would write his first book, titled simply Nature, and nature resulted in large part from Emerson's voracious appetite for knowledge while he continued to read from any number of disciplines. It was the German philosopher Goethe that most resonated with Emerson. From Richard's biography, Richardson's biography. Emerson had been struck in 1832 by a review of Goethe in which Carlyle, that's a British thinker and historian, listed some excerpts on reverence that he read in Goethe. Reverence for what is above leads us to ethnic or national religion. Reverence for what is around us leads us to philosophic religion. Reverence for what is under us is true Christianity. And out of these three reverences springs the highest reverence, reverence for oneself. That passage may read pretty clunky, but within that, is the basis for where Emerson goes next, his theology of reverence. Because what Emerson found in Goethe was permission to follow truth from the inside out, 
Some century and a quarter later, we might shrug our shoulders and wonder why all the fuss about finding one owns path. But in an age in which mainstream Unitarianism still looked to scripture, tradition, miracles, reason as the only means to truth, giving our hearts the final say was radical stuff. Before we move into the crux of the second half of Emerson's life, let me pause to say that, at least for me, his true greatness lies in his dogged devotion to the quest no matter what. His faith was grounded in reason, but open to those experiences reason is yet to explain. By this I mean Emerson intuitively heeded the Buddhist counsel to be a lifelong novice. Emerson never seems to tire of asking himself, is yesterday's truth sufficient for today? This period between the great the two great loves of Emerson's life was marked with more winter as he continued to grieve for Ellen. So he turned to travel and reading for his solace, but he also began spending more and more time outdoors. He saw in the seasons the cycles of birth and decay and death and rebirth. He saw in soaring, soaring birds the quest for spiritual freedom. He saw in flowers the fragile beauty of life. And in this time of sorrow, he found healing in nature, but equally profound. He came to believe that what was happening as he walked through nature was an alchemy, an elemental bonding of his soul to a God as manifested in the physical world. Still, Emerson wrote in his journal that nature, as calming and restorative as it was for him, was missing something. Actually, it was missing someone. There is a sense of loneliness in this writing, even as Emerson's star began to rise. This unsatisfied craving for human companionship only added to his winter. Lydia Jackson was a member of the Unitarian Church in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where Emerson occasionally preached. Both her parents had died when she was 16, and her brother while she was still quite young. And like Emerson, Lydia had a, a thirst for knowledge, a passion for poetry. Saints be praised, Waldo Emerson had found another soulmate. Emerson proposed to Lydia via letter on January 24th, 1835. Her acceptance arrived via letter four days later. In what still remains as a bit of a mystery, Emerson began calling her Lydian. Some had suggested he hated the R sound that some New Englanders gave their ends. Others believe it was in keeping with Emerson's own change in names, signaling a new phase of life. And whatever the reason, Lydia was flexible enough to become Lydian Jackson Emerson. By now, Emerson has attracted or recruited like minds, not as disciples, but fellow travelers who would eventually be labeled transcendentalists. There are multiple ways to approach that very fluid band of seekers and thinkers. One of my favorite comes from another of Emerson's biographies, Perry Miller, who describes them as 19th century hippies, railing against the man, railing against the strict religious rationalism of the day, including that of mainstream Unitarianism. When we think of transcendentalists, we often begin with some names. Let me drop some names. Frederick Henry Hedge, George Ripley, Orestes Brownson, James Freeman Clark, and then continuing on through Henry David Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, Theodore Parker, Lydia Maria Child, Bronson Alcott. Transcendentalism was a thorough dislike of rationalism for rationalism's sake, and all these folks adhered to that new gospel. And we should pause to note the term transcendentalist was attached to Emerson et al., by their opponents. It was a derogatory term. As David Robinson points out in his book, The Unitarians and the Universalists, transcendentalism was and remains a confusing term 
for a group of disaffected Unitarian abolitionists who found the religion of their younger days too cold, too conventional. The transcendentalists, they adhered to the scientific method, yet fiercely believed that some of the best things in life could not be reduced to cause and effect. So they called for religion rooted in the conscience and intuition of each person. If rank and file transcendentalists raised the hackles of all the folks at the American Unitarian Association, and they pretty much did, Emerson became the focus of their scorn. And his status in infamy was sealed by his now famous Divinity School Address. Between that second marriage in 1834 and the date of the Divinity School Address in July 1838, Emerson kept himself busy reading, writing, lecturing, most of it from his home in Concord. His belief in the individual as the final arbiter of truth grew even stronger, resulting in his first book, Great Fame, ongoing criticism from many quarters, especially among Unitarian clergy. He further infuriated his former colleagues by saying that too much theology is focused on the past, when, when humans settle for a hand-me-down relationship with ultimate mystery. He asked, why should we not also enjoy an original relationship to the universe? Emerson spent the first half of his life choosing from others the best that they had to offer. And now he designed a series of sermons and lectures drawn from his own life, laying the foundation for what he called self-reliance, the wonderful, awful taking of responsibility for our own souls. As with other transcendentalists, Emerson had a strong activist ethnic, ethic. And by the time he delivered the Harvard Divinity Address in 1838, Emerson had begun naming societal injustices in his speeches, including a scathing lecture against the Trail of Tears, President Andrew Jackson's forced relocation of ind indigenous Americans. That invitation to speak at Harvard came from three promising young graduates. graduates they were almost half the small class. Emerson heard him out, was moved by their passion for work, the work of theology, as well as the opportunity to, to critique Unitarianism and the way it trained its ministers. All of these things were just too much to resist. Suffice it to say that in that address, Emerson went off on pretty much everything to do with mainstream Unitarianism, and he made the case for another of his terms, self-reliance the notion that each person holds in their trust la, truth. Let me get that right. Each person holds, in their, holds their trust in their minds and their hearts. Religion from the inside out. I keep referring to that address because it really was a seminal experience in Unitarianism. So I want to quote a few lines from that address. These are probably the most quoted of all time. He wrote, Whenever the pulpit is usurped by a formalist, then the worshiper is defrauded and disconsolate, because we shrink as soon as the prayers begin, which do not uplift, but smite and offend us. We are fain to wrap our cloaks around us and secure as best we can a solitude that hears not. I once heard a preacher who scarcely, who sorely tempted me to say I would go to church no more. I'm going to use the original language here. Men go, thought I, where they are wont to go, else had no soul entered the temple in the afternoon. A snowstorm was falling around us. The snowstorm was real, and the preacher was merely spectral. And the eye felt in sad contrast in looking at him and then out the window behind him in the beautiful meteor of snow. Still Emerson. This preacher had lived in vain. He had not one word intimating that he had laughed or wept, was married in love, had been commended or cheated or chagrined. If he had ever lived and acted, we were none the wiser for it. Not one fact in all his experience had he yet imported into his doctrine. The true preacher can be known by this. 
but he deals out to, to his people life passed through the fire. It seems strange to me that the people should come to church. It seemed to me as if their houses must be very unentertaining, that they should prefer this thoughtless clamor. Ouch. As you might imagine, responses to the address were mixed. Responses to the dress were mixed, as the majority of them were condemning Emerson as an atheist and just another bitter ex-minister. Emerson continued his speaking tours on the surface unfazed by those critics, but on the inside, the rejections only felt, only fed his melancholy. Emerson's evolving theology was held together by yet another term, what he called the oversoul, loosely translated as an impersonal God, having nothing to do with original sin, judgment, or miracles. It was the oversoul that most offended his hearers and readers, because once again he was daring to have an original relationship with the holy. Time requires we move on. So just a caveat that Emerson's career was now in full flower. He had survived the death of he and Lydian's son, the civil war, and a fire that destroyed most of their home, somehow spared the library. And yet, with all of this, Emerson found the moxie to carry on. But he grew, he grew ill in the summer of 1882, following a long trip to Egypt. He was no longer touring, just writing. It's not clear if he's entering into dementia, but his diary indicates something other than his usual winter was coming on. And now he rarely saw visitors, even those closest to him. Returning to Richardson's biography on Emerson, on the night of April 29, 1882, Emerson finished reading, he locked the study windows, and doused the fire before going upstairs to lie down with Lydian one more time. So what to make of Emerson? Is he a fit guide for our own spiritual journeys, or does his staunch individualism create more problems than it solves? The late UU minister of Forest Church suggested that Emerson's greatest legacy is in his ability to bridge strict rationalism and intuition that in a very clear and tangible way, the transcendentalist changed the face of Unitarianism. The church also suggests that Emerson and the other transcendentalists, they laid the ground for, groundwork for a new way to be religious in general, and a new way to be a religious liberal in particular. So in Emerson's case, his best work was accomplished from the internal winter that hung over him. Here he was in his own pain, pointing to other pain, the pain of others, the pain of a denomination seemingly lost, it, had, having lost its way. Emerson called into question the forms and the norms of what he called historical religion, and he opened the door for the rest of us to understand reason and mystery as being two opposites but not really. For Emerson, these were the keys to a fuller life. So we remember the life of Waldo Emerson, all his blind spots, all his frailties. We remember him as our progressive religious cousin, equal parts talent and melancholy. And as I ended last time when we talked about Emerson, we remember him most and best for his courage. We thank you once again for spending time with us, whether you're a first-timer or a long-timer. We wish you the best possible winter holiday season and to join us for an online Christmas service to be posted next Wednesday or Thursday. We close this service with thoughts from UU Minister Barbara Peskin. Because of those who came before, we are in spite of their failings, we believe. Because of, and in spite of the horizons of their visions, 
V2 dream. Let us go, remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, to bow to the mystery.